Welcome back. Welcome back to our Discover Coding workshops. Um, for those of you who don't know or might have forgotten, uh, my name's Bruce. Uh, I'm leading the workshop today. Um, last time, you'll remember, we went through some basic data types as well as a few, uh, a few ways to deal with null values uh, more intelligently with more intentionality so that you know what you're doing with your data, how you're manipulating it. Uh, today, we are going to be running through how to uh, combine multiple data frames into a single collection of data. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit how to uh, talk a little bit about how to work with data from multiple sources, how we can combine those data sets, um, and ultimately we're going to show you how to uh, put some data frames together, export that to a CSV. Uh, and we are also going to talk about some of the different ways in which you can join data, uh, which may be familiar to you. So let's get right to it. Um, one thing that I will mention is uh, for this workshop, you will need to have uh, downloaded the uh, species.csv file from, the, uh, from our, our site's setup page. Um, if you didn't do that at the start of the last lesson, um, I'll give you a few minutes to do it now. should have mentioned this earlier, but uh, let me just pull it up. So the place you can find it is right here at this URL, datacarpentry.org slash Python ecology lesson slash setup.html and this species.csv file. Um, if you don't have it, we'll give you a few minutes to go and grab it now. And this is also probably a good time to tell you about the uh, post-it note visual language that we use, which I think, yep, here we go. I have a whiteboard here to demonstrate. Uh, but I'm not going to be able to get it out around all those cables. <laughs> this was a mistake. It's OK. Uh, the point is, you'll notice you've got two post-it notes next to your uh, next to your place setting, next to your desk. Um, if everything's going okay, if you don't need any help, if your code is working, if you're done whatever exercise, take the blue post-it note, stick it on top of your laptop. That's how we'll know that everything is going fine and you're ready to go. Um, if you're having any trouble, if something's not working out, if you're not sure how to progress, uh, take the red post-it note, slap that on top of your laptop, and uh, one of our helpers will be around to help you. The helpers are over there. Uh, so I'll give you just a couple minutes to download the file, uh, species.csv, if you don't have it already. Um, you'll also want species subset.csv, depending on how far we get. Um, store them in the same place as your surveys.csv file, and you should be good to go. If you run into any problems with that, Put the uh, red post-it note on your computer, and we'll be by to help you out.
Okay. Uh, I'm seeing some blue post-its, so I think we're doing okay. Uh, but again, if at any point you need help through the lesson, feel free to use that red sticky note to indicate that you're having trouble. One of our helpers will be around to help. Let's head back over to our notebook and, am I? Yeah, I'm coming in. Okay, good. Um, let's head back over to our notebook and start merging some data frames. So to this point, we've been working with data that's just been in one file, uh, importing it into one data frame, and we've been operating on that. Um, and that's fine. But in the real world, a lot of the time, uh, your data is going to come in in multiple files or across multiple data frames. And to analyze it properly, we're going to need to combine them into a single data frame. Um, fortunately, Pandas gives us a lot of options for ways to do this. Um, there are multiple methods to combine data frames together, but the two big ones are uh, a function called merge and another called concat, which is short for concatenate, so putting two things together. So uh, to, um, to work through this, we are going to need to import our two data frames. So let's start by importing pandas as pd. That'll give us access to the pandas library. Uh, and create surveys underscore data frame. It's going to equal pd dot read underscore csv surveys dot csv. Yep. Uh, now we're going to do something a little different here. We're going to use a couple of options for this function that we haven't used to this point. I'm going to type them out here and then I'll explain what they do. We're going to use keep underscore default underscore NA. And we're going to say that equals false. And we are also going to pass in NA underscore values. And that's, an, uh, that's a list, so the open, or er, whoops, sorry. First we need to put the equals, because it's a parameter. But then we're going to pass that a list that contains an empty string. Now we're going to run that. Oh, one last thing. I'm going to slide in under that and print out surveys df. So this all looks very familiar. Um, Briefly, what those parameters do, um, keep default NA false combined with NA values containing an empty string just means that uh, we are telling, um, we're telling uh, pandas to take anything in our CSV that's an empty string and assign it a value of nan. So it's not uh, it won't only assign NAN to pandas, uh, pandas default interpretation of what constitutes a null value. Uh, this lets us pass in alternative values that we may wish to consider as null, in this case, an empty string. So just essentially uh, whatever is in NA, the, uh, uh, the list you pass for NA values, if you pass in keep default NA, equals false as well. Pandas will take everything in your NA values list in addition to everything it already considers to be a null value and create, it'll assign not a number to all of those. So, uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll actually just delete this line right here. We've seen this data frame enough times before so that you can keep an eye on this code as I'm going ahead. But before we continue, we're also going to want to import our species CSV. So I'm going to make a variable called species df. I'm going to say that equals pd.read underscore CSV. And I'm going to pass it species.csv. And like above, I'm going to say keep default NA equals 
false and na underscore values equals a list containing an empty string. And if we do that, we can see that resolves as well. Uh, I'll actually print out species data frame just because we haven't had an opportunity to see what's in that yet. So we can take a look at species data frame. Uh, and what we get is we have this species ID, which you may recognize as being in our surveys data frame. Um, you'll recall that in surveys, every species was defined by a two-letter uh, code. What you can see here is what that code represents. So uh, AS, we can see, is short for Amadromus savinarum, which is a bird. So this is a, uh, a data frame that expands on the species information in our, uh, in our data frame, or in our survey data frame. And once again, I'm just going to get rid of this line here so that we don't have that cluttering up our page. So now we've got two data frames. We've got a data frame containing our survey data, and we've got a data frame containing our species data. Now what we can do is we can start concatenating these data frames together uh, and manipulating those results. So let's start with concat. Uh, concat, like I said, is short for concatenate. Uh, concat lets you append either columns or rows from one data frame onto another. <coughs> and to show you what that looks like, I'm going to grab some subsets of our data. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, nothing too complex. I'm going to be using the head and tail functions that we've seen before. So I'm going to say survey underscore sub equals surveys underscore df dot head. I'm going to pass 10 to the function head. So that'll get the first 10 rows of the survey data frame. I'm also going to say survey sub last 10 equals surveys df dot tail 10. So that'll get us the first 10 and then the last 10 from our surveys data frame. Uh, so just a couple of small subsets that we can um, we can manipulate. And I'm going to do one last thing here. Survey sub last 10, returning to our variable. And I'm going to say equals survey sub last 10 dot, and I'm going to use a function called reset underscore index. I'm going to pass in a parameter called drop equals drop equals true. So what does that do? Well, um, when we get the survey sub last 10 variable, um, the indices are going to correspond to what they are in the survey's data frame. So for example, if our data frame went from 1 to 20 and we got the last 10, the indices of that data frame would not be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They'd be 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. And when we're combining data frames, that can cause a problem. If our indices don't line up correctly, we can wind up with a very strangely structured data frame. Uh, we'll see more what that looks like when I start printing this out. Um, the drop true variable that I passed in uh, means that pandas won't, pandas has a bit of default behavior where it will add a column to combined data frames uh, that preserves the old index values. Sometimes that can be useful. In this case, we don't want it. 
So drop true will just tell pandas, hey, discard the old index information, don't make a new column for it, I don't need to see it. Again, I'll show you what that looks like in just a moment. So we set all that up. Now that we've got it, now that we've got those two data frames, we've got the indices all lined up properly, we can start concatenating them. When we concatenate data frames, we need to specify the axis on which we are operating. Um, axis is a, uh, a parameter that you're going to pass to the concat variable, or the concat function, rather. Uh, axis zero will tell pandas to stack the second data frame under the first one. So it's a vertical stack. Axis zero is, you can think of it as being the rows of the data frame. On the other hand, if we pass in axis equals one, what that'll do is it will uh, it'll stack them horizontally. So it'll append the second data frame to the right of the first one. Uh, so you, again, you can think of axis one as being like the columns going across. Um, both of these are useful depending on the kind of data that you have. Uh, I'll show you what it looks like to actually concatenate data, the kind of results that you get. Um, and that should help illustrate that some of these are going to be appropriate for some kinds of data, and some of them are not. So let's start with a vertical stack. I'm going to make a variable called vertical underscore stack, and I'm going to say that equals pd dot concat survey underscore sub. Uh, the first parameter that we pass to this function has to be a list. It's the list of the data frames that we're going to concatenate into each other. And we are going to print, or, uh, we're going to pass in survey sub and survey sub last 10. Oop, whoops. There's no second underscore, or no third underscore there. Survey sub last 10. And we are going to pass in axis equals zero. Also going to, yeah, okay. I'm going to print out vertical stack so you can see what that looks like. And actually, just before I go on, I'm going to print survey sub here, and I will print, I'll show you what these look like. Um, oops, whoops. This should go down here. <laughs> um. Oh, I see. I've accidentally introduced a slash up there. Okay, so this is our survey sub data frame. As you can see, it's the first 10 rows of our survey's data frame. Likewise, if I print out survey sub last 10, you can see it's the last 10 rows, but because we've reset the indices, it goes from 0 to 9 rather than 35,539 to 35,548. I'll show you what that looks like. If I comment out this line here where we reset the indices, then you can see the indices run from, they're, they're the actual indices from the data frame. 35,539 to 35,548. So that illustrates what reset index does for us. It changes the indices so that it treats it as a whole new data frame. It discards the old uh, index data and just gives us 0 through 9. I'll also show you what it looks like when we uh, ignore the drop true. Uh, just because that's useful to see as well. So if we do that, if we don't pass in drop equals true, you can see that, like I said, it creates a column that contains the old index information. Sometimes you might want that. It's useful to be able to do. Um, in this case, though, we don't want it. We don't need it. So I'm going to pass drop equals 
true back into reset index. And when we do that, you can see it gets rid of the old index column. So we've discarded all the old index information. Uh, now, I got a little away from showing you how to concatenate things, but I did just give you a lot of information. So let me pause and just ask, what are your questions? Is there anything you'd like to know? Anything that you'd like clarified? Additional information? Cool. All right. Oh, sorry. Um, all right. So let's start out with our vertical stack. We've already set up this code. Vertical stack equals pd dot concat, so the pandas concatenate function, passing in a list of survey sub and survey sub last 10. Those are the two data frames we want to concatenate. We could pass in an arbitrary number of data frames. And we're concatenating it on axis 0. So um, that'll be a vertical stack. It'll concatenate them one on top of the other. And if we do that, we can see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And underneath that, our second set, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So that's our first nine, uh, our, our first 10, sorry, 0 to 9. Uh, those are first 10 rows concatenated on top of our last 10 rows. The other way we can do this, of course, is to do a horizontal stack, which equals pd dot concat, oop, concat survey underscore sub, side of a list, so square brackets, and survey sub last 10 axis oops, axis equals 1. And we'll print that out as well just by typing horizontal stack. If we do that, we have to scroll sideways a little bit, but you can see we've taken our, we still ha we have 9, or 10 rather, rows. But if we scroll across, we can see that over here, record ID repeats. Because we've taken our first data frame, which is record ID, oh, whoops, eh, sorry, record ID uh, all the way to weight, and we've concatenated it horizontally with our second data frame, which is again, record ID to weight. Yes, yeah, so you have a question. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't quite hear that. Uh, if you don't, so the question is what will happen if you don't pass in axis equals 1? Uh, well, the default, I believe, is, uh, I believe axis equals 0 is the default. So if we do that, I think we will just get vertical stack again. Yeah, um, zero is the default. So we could do, in fact, we could do uh, this without passing in, like if we didn't pass in axis zero up here, the same thing would happen as is happening now because zero is the default. If you don't pass in uh, an axis variable, pandas will assume that you want to concatenate them vertically along axis zero. So. Yeah, if you pass in one here, uh, then, oops, whoops, uh, I'm sorry, I accidentally deleted it. Or, no, no I didn't, it just scrolled down. Yeah, if you pass in one, uh, it'll concatenate them horizontally. Uh, the variable name doesn't matter. I'm just calling it vertical stack and horizontal stack as being illustrative. Uh, it doesn't actually have anything to do with, w we could call it anything. We could call it uh, x or, you know, yeah, it, it doesn't have to be, um, yeah, sorry, yeah. So what would happen, these are the same length, what happens if they're different lengths in the horizontal stacks? Like one's 12 and one's 10, you just get a bunch of NEMs in there? 
Uh, let's find out. We can illustrate that. Um, so let's suppose that instead of 10 and 10, I got 10 and 12, as you say. It's a, it's a great question because you're going to wind up with weird asymmetrical data sets a lot. And we're going we're gonna to learn how to manage uh, data sets in a couple of different ways, but this is a good thing to see, I think. So, yeah. Now our survey, uh, our survey sub last 10 is 12 records long instead of 10. So let me just make sure I'm set up here properly. So, if we do a vertical stack, we stack vertically. That doesn't cause any problems. Uh, the reason being, the columns are the same. And because we're stacking them one on top of the other, because we have the same number of columns in the same order, referring to all the same things, they stack up just fine. Uh, you could, mm, one sec. Yeah, yeah, so um, this, Pandas will only check that there are the right number of columns and I believe the right column format. Um, I don't think it cares what the columns are called. So uh, this can cause problems if you have columns that represent different data sets. Um, so there's always, there's a level of intentionality that has to happen when you're ca uh, concatenating data sets uh, to know what you're putting together. But broadly, as long as you have the same number of columns uh, with the same data formats, Pandas won't have a problem with that. But as for stacking things, oops. As for stacking things horizontally, let me make sure that I've got this. So there, access one. So if we do that, we can see that indeed we do have two extra rows down here where the, uh, these two rows where they would be part of the first data frame are completely null. Because that data frame doesn't have those records. It's only got the first, uh, it's only got 10 rows in it, so up to the 10th row, the data's there, and then there's nothing. But over here, we can see that data in the data frame that has 12 entries, uh, we can see that data is present. So, yeah, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great question to, to know what happens when we've got data sets that don't neatly line up uh, with column and row values. Now, there is one other thing I will show off here. If we take a look at vertical stack, we can see that it numbers off 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and then it starts over again, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, well, in this case, up to 10, uh, 10 and 11, because we're still dealing with the 12-row uh, the data set. Um, this can be a bit of a headache. Um, it's, a, it's not a, a super useful way to display your data. So one thing that you can do is, as we did before, we can use the reset index function. Uh, and we have to assign that to the vertical stack variable. And if we print vertical stack after that, uh, I'm also going to, well, I'll, just, I'll run this first. If we do that, we can see our indices now are numbered sensibly. 0 to 21. Uh, you can also see that because we didn't pass in uh, drop, the index column is there preserving the old index information. Um, that may actually be useful in this case. Uh, you could envision a, a scenario where you're concatenating data from across multiple parts of the data set but you want to have, uh, you want to retain a reference to where, the data, where in the data frame the data originally came from. So you're not always going to want to drop that column. Sometimes you're going to want to retain it. It's information, and if you need it, you want to be able to, you want to know how to, how to hold on to it. So 
So that's uh, that's a, uh, a brief introduction to concatenating data frames. It's a simple way to stick them together vertically or horizontally. Um, but as you can see, it does. There, there's possibilities uh, that I'm, I'm sure you can imagine for uh, problems creeping in if if it's if it's done carelessly. Um, before we go on, uh, what are your questions? Is there anything else you might like to have expanded on? I'm sorry? Mm. Um, we are going to get into, uh, when we talk about the, the Python merge function, um, merge operates much more similarly to how a, uh, how you think of combining tables in a data frame um, with a left join or an outer join, et cetera. Um, Python can interact with databases to return data, but that's not really what we're doing here. Uh, this is once your data is already in Python. But uh, if you're familiar with SQL, um, the merge function I think will seem pretty natural uh, because it operates on much the same principle. Further questions? Okay, cool. Uh, all right, uh, so last time we saw how to write out uh, data from our data frame to a CSV file. We're going to circle back on that briefly. Um, we are, uh, last time we saw that we could do, uh, we could do this with the to CSV command. So I'm going to take our vertical stack data frame and I'm going to use the to CSV function, to underscore CSV. And I'm going to put that out to um, vertical stack out dot CSV. And I'm also going to include another parameter, index equals false. And what that will do is it just ensures that pandas won't include the index number for each line in our CSV. So if we run that, it doesn't produce any output in our notebook, but if we go back out here, we can see we now have vertical stack out.csv, which it's quite low down here. It's at the very bottom. I should have picked something starting with A. It would have appeared higher up, but if we open that up, we can see there's our CSV data. And I'll show you what it looks like if we uh, don't pass in, oops. if we don't pass in this index equals false, This? Um, sorry? This line? Okay. Yeah, sure. So, did I run this? I think I ran this. Yeah, okay. Um, if we omit the uh, index equals false, uh, then if we look at our vertical stack out.csv, we can see it's preserved the index data uh, in the furthest left column, but it hasn't named it anything, which is, um, that can be confusing if, uh, if somebody looking at the CSV doesn't know 
what they're looking at. You can see also that there is an index column right next to that. So we have a blank nameless column containing the index and then another column called index containing a completely different set of data. But you'll recall, if we go back here, when we generated or regenerated vertical stack here by resetting the index, we didn't tell it to drop the index column. So we still have both the index and the old index. So you can see how that might get to be a little bit confusing uh, if you're not being careful with how you save your index data or um, store it or resave it. Um, interestingly, a fun thing you can do, uh, I'm going to just get rid of that. Well, uh, I'm going to comment these lines out so that I don't accidentally run them again. Um, once you've got your CSV there, you can, of course, read it back in. And this is a useful thing to try, just um, because it ensures that your data can be read back in, that there were no errors in creating it. So if you were to say a vertical from file equals pd.read CSV, CSV vertical stack out dot CSV and you print it out vertical from file. If we did that, you can see our data comes back in with this unnamed column, unnamed column zero, which we know represents index. Let's actually clean this up a little bit as long as we're here. We can fix this up by applying the drop equals true to our reset index. So. That's odd. Is that? Um, all right. I've lost track of my variables here as, as it happens. That's my bad. Um, we'll not dwell over long on that because the last thing you guys want to see is me futzing with individual cells quietly going, uh, is this where I introduced that column? Uh. So instead, we will, uh, we'll continue on, but Maybe think of, the, uh, th think of tidying up that data frame as, as an exercise for the reader. OK, so moving on. Uh, we've talked a lot about concatenation, sticking data frames together in this kind of very straightforward way. But now let's talk about joining data frames. Uh, that lets us use columns in each data set that contain common values, a unique ID to uh, join data frames together rather than just gluing them together on the top or the bottom as we've been doing with concat. Um, combining data frames using a common key is called joining and the columns containing those common values are called our join keys. Um, as I was saying, if you're familiar with SQL, this may seem a little familiar. Uh, and joining data frames in this way is super useful when one of our tables, in this case, like our species table, is a lookup table, which contains additional data that we don't necessarily, or well, cont that contains additional data that we want to include in the table, but don't necessarily want to repeat uh, in the table itself. What I mean is, um, when I say that the species.csv file that we've sort of looked at briefly, I'll print that out again here just so that we can get a look at it. Species DF. So this, um, we pulled this in at the start. Uh, this table contains the genus and the species and the taxa code for 55 different species that were collected in this survey. The species ID, species code, over here in the far left, that's unique for each line. Uh, so those species are the ones that are identified in our survey data uh, and also they function as our unique species code. So you can see that it 
helps to have this data abstracted out into its own file because if we just put it in our survey's data frame, we would add three more columns for 35,549 rows. That's extra overhead uh, that we don't necessarily need when we can just break it out here and join the data frames together. When we want access to that information, we can build out a query that joins our columns together uh, and appends our species information onto the, uh, onto the survey data table. So yeah, storing data like this in lookup tables and in data tables has, uh, has a variety of benefits. Uh, it ensures uh, consistency in, your, uh, in the data that you're looking up. You can imagine that if we put genus, species, and taxa in the survey's data frame, when it comes to uh, 35,549 rows, that's a lot of places to accidentally make a typo um, that will be very difficult to track down later. Uh, it makes it easy for us to make changes to the species information because we only have to change it once here uh, and not everywhere that it occurs in the survey's data frame. And as I mentioned, it helps optimize the size of our data. Uh, as you have bigger and bigger and bigger data sets, adding more and more columns to more and more rows becomes less and less efficient. So when we structure our data like this, we have, uh, we have the freedom to optimize the size of our data a little bit. That was a lot of conceptual information, so I'll stop and check in and ask, uh, what questions do you have? Everything clicking in all right? Okay, cool, good. All right, let's start out by doing some joins. So let's get the first 10 lines of our data, again, um, as a subset. So survey sub equals surveys underscore df dot head 10. So that will get our surveys data frame. And we're also going to grab from that species subset file um, that we pulled in uh, at the start of the lesson. Uh, I will give you a second to get it if you don't have it. But before that, I'm just going to type this in here. Species sub equals pd dot read CSV. Species subset dot CSV. And I'm going to use keep default NA equals false, false. And NA values equals blank string. And I'll just pop this down here. Boom. OK. So uh, I'll leave that code up there and give you a second to run it. But also, I'll just give you a chance to grab the species subset file uh, if you haven't had a chance to get it, if you didn't have a second at the beginning of the class, now you can run and grab it from the site, which I will paste into the cell here. That website right there is where you can go to get the files. So if you didn't have a chance to grab species subset, we'll let you grab it now. If you run into any problems, use the red post-it note and we'll be around to help.
All right. Seen a lot of blue post-it notes, so I think we're good. All right, so yeah, just to go back over this, um, in this example, species sub is the lookup table containing the genus, the species, and the taxon names that we want to join with the data in survey sub. Um, when we do that, it'll produce a new data frame that has columns from both species DF and survey DF. So, we mentioned earlier the notion of join keys, the columns that we use to join data together. Um, to identify those keys, we, uh, we need to know which fields are shared across the two data frames. Um, you may know these just from knowing the data. You may need to inspect the data frames to do so. Um, if you really luck out, then both data frames will contain columns that contain the same data that are named the same. Uh, realistically, you may have to do a little investigation to figure out what your optimal join keys are going to be. So let's just take a look briefly at uh, our two data frames. If we see, if we go to species underscore sub, and we take a look at that columns attribute. Okay, so our columns are species ID, genus, species, and taxa. That's great. If we check out survey sub dot columns, and we spell columns correctly, that's a critical step. We've got record ID, month, day, year, plot ID, species ID, and sex, and hind foot length and weight. So we've lucked out with this data. Uh, in that species ID is shared across both columns, or uh, both data frames, and in both data frames, that column contains the two letter key that we've been working with. So, now we can start joining the data, except there are different kinds of joins, and it's useful to know which is which. So, I will go over to here. There are diagrams that'll help make this all make a little more sense. All right. So this handy Venn diagram here is the first type of join that we're looking at, which is called an inner join. And this is a fairly common type of, uh, of join. Um, inner joins, as this Venn diagram suggests, combine two data frames based on a join key and return a new data frame that contains only the rows that have matching values in both of the original data frames. So it'll only give you back information where, um, where, or sorry, it'll only give you back rows wherein there's a match between the join columns. Um, in other words, they'll give you a data frame that only contains rows where the value being joined exists in both tables. So let's, I'll give you a second to take in this Venn diagram. Um, the pandas function for performing joins is, uh, as I intimated earlier, merge. And uh, the inner join is the default option when you just run merge. So let's see what that looks like. Uh, which one am I at here? Here we go. All right. So let's say merged underscore inner equals pd dot merge. The first parameter we have to pass is our left table. Left equals survey sub and right equals species sub. When we talk about the other kinds of joins, it'll become a little clearer what left and right denotes. Um, in this specific case, species ID is the only column that exists in both data frames. We're only joining on the one column. Um, uh, oh, um, so it's, it's a little harder to see uh, what left and right denote. We also have these parameters left on, which we're going to call species ID. Let me just quickly put a line break so that's a little easier to read. 
and right on is also species ID. Again, because we're joining uh, these two tables and we only have one column, uh, one column that we can join them on and it's named the same in both tables, if we left out left on and right on, we would get the same result. Uh, but those parameters are what let you specify if you had two columns containing the same data but which were named differently uh, or you were trying to join on uh, a different subset of columns, you would want to be, you would want to use these parameters to specify that information. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So you can see, there's our survey data. Uh, record ID, month, day, year, plot ID, species ID, sex, hind foot length, and weight. But you can see over here, we have three extra columns, genus, species, and taxa. So what we've done is, when we've joined, we've gone through the lookup table. We found uh, places where the, uh, for example, NL species exists in both tables done is we've taken the, uh, taken the data from the lookup table where the species ID is NL and we've appended it to that row. You can see because it's NL in both of these rows, we've appended it twice. We've appended it to both of those rows. Same data, both rows. You can also see that uh, our merged data frame is smaller than our original data frame. Uh, we've got eight rows here instead of ten. What this means is there were two rows where the species ID in our, uh, in our survey data didn't line up with anything in our lookup table. So because we're doing an inner join and an inner join only contains information, uh, only contains rows where the join key exists in both tables, Panda said, that, uh, that species ID isn't in our lookup table, we're going to discard those rows. So we have a data frame that is smaller than the data frame we started with. Right. So the next kind of join that we're going to talk about, moving on from the inner join, um, Anyone have any questions about inner joins? Yes. So what would have happened if you had more joins? Like in your lookup table, like you have it to have two rows for the same species? What would have happened in your Okay, the, uh, so what would have happened if uh, in our lookup table we had um, two, two, spe two species ID that were the same? Yeah, two rows with the same species ID. Um, in short, and uh, maybe my helpers can scare me straight on this if I'm wrong, but I believe at that point you wouldn't be able to use it as a join key. I believe that join keys do have to be unique. Uh, do they not? At least in your lookup table, right? Yeah. No, it would join and make two rows. Ah, that makes more sense, yes. Okay, so you would wind up with not duplicated data, but you would wind up with two rows, one where it had applied your first uh, set of NL, for example, da uh, data, and another row where it had applied your second set of NL data. So in our example up here where we've got two NL rows, it would actually give us four rows. Interesting. Okay. Good to know. <clears throat> um, further clarifications, questions? No? We're doing good. Okay, cool. Have the time. Okay. So the next kind of join we are going to examine is the left join. Again, we have a helpful Venn diagram to illustrate what that looks like. And this is where we start to get into uh, specifics on what left and right actually mean. Um, so left joins help us answer the question, 
what if we want to add information to, uh, from species sub into survey sub without losing any of the information in survey sub? Because as you saw, we lost a couple of rows when we just did an inner join. So a left join is going to help us uh, join those two data frames without losing any of the data in our left-hand table. Um, a left join still uses join keys to combine the two data frames, uh, but it will return all of the rows in the left data frame, even those that contain a, um, a join key that doesn't have a corresponding value in the, uh, in the, the right data frame. Um, in the instance that we have a row that ha uh, a row in our left data frame that doesn't have a corresponding row in our right data frame, pandas will automatically fill the corresponding rows with null values. Uh, and as this Venn diagram suggests, data from the right-hand table can still be discarded if it doesn't have a corresponding left-hand value. So this will only preserve stuff that is uh, rows that are in the left table. Let's take a look at how we do that. So let's call it merged left. And that is going to equal PD dot merge. Again, we're going to say left equals survey sub, right equals, oh, sorry, that doesn't need to be a string. I'm passing in the variable name. So take out those single quotes in there if you, if you put them in. Right equals species sub. And we're going to pass in a new parameter just called how. It's called that way because it's how you join the tables. So like I said, inner is the default. If you want to do a left join, you have to pass left in as your how parameter. And we're going to say left. Uh, I'll put a line break there, make it easier to read. Left on is still going to equal species ID, species underscore ID, and right on is still going to equal species ID, because again, column is called the same thing in both tables, and we only want to use, uh, we're only, we only have the one column we're going to join on. So, if we do that, and then we print out merged left, we can see we have our full 10 rows again, rather than just having eight. And we can also see, if we scroll over here, a couple of these rows, the ones that have um, PF for the species ID, where other rows have genus, species, and taxa filled out, uh, those rows just have null values. And I believe species sub isn't too big. I can check this out. Yeah, OK. So species sub only has these three rows in it. And you can see there isn't a PF species code. There's DM, NL, and PE. So in our uh, in our inner join, uh, those rows were discarded because they don't have a corresponding value in our lookup table. But in our left join, we keep those values and we just put NANs in there instead. So, so those are two, uh, two of the kinds of joins you can do. There are others. We're not going to spend quite as much time on them. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, the merge function supports two other join types. Um, the first is a right join, um, which you would invoke by passing how equals right as an argument. Um, it's, as the name implies, similar to a left join, left join uh, except all the rows from the right data frame are kept while rows from the left data frame without matching join keys are discarded. Uh, we can see what that looks like. I'll just, I'll edit this code. So if we instead call this merged right, 
And if we pass in how equals right, species ID is still what we're joining on. If we do that, we can see that in this specific case, the, um, the output is similar to the uh, inner join. Because again, in a right join, anything in the left table that doesn't have a, um, uh, that doesn't have a, a corresponding, uh, a corresponding value in the right hand table is discarded. Um, this is not the best example of a right join. Um, since the two data frames are so different and the, um, uh, the, the way the data is being combined doesn't really show us keeping data from the right hand table. Um, but it's useful to think about. Um, if we had a Venn diagram for it, it would look pretty similar to this left join table except our right hand table would be completely filled in and this chunk of the left table would be blank. Uh, the last kind of join that merge supports is called an outer join or a full join. Um, we would invoke that by passing in uh, how equals outer. Um, and that join type will return all of the valid pairwise combinations from both row, uh, combinations of rows from both of the data frames. Um, the resulting data frame will just have, much like the left join, uh, a null value where data is missing in one of the data frames. Uh, this one, this kind of join is used less, uh, in, at least in these contexts, um, since it can produce a lot of data that maybe is not necessarily, <coughs> not necessarily useful. Uh, but it's good to know about all of your options. Um, I would encourage you to check those out uh, and investigate them, see if they're, maybe they're right for the data that you want to put together. Uh, but that's, those are the four types of join that are supported by merge. Uh, inner, left, right, and outer. Uh, just before we move on, any, anything you'd like to know? What questions have you got about, uh, about joining? Everybody's good? Okay. Um, uh, yes and no. I don't think Python's merge function will let you join three at once. Uh, you would have to join two tables and then join the third table to that table. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know that there is a single command that will let you merge more than two tables together at one time. Okay, well it sounds like you are all ready to do some exercises. So I'll leave these up here. Um, this is the last thing we're gonna get to today. Uh, but by all means, take a look at these, work through them. Uh, we may not have an opportunity to uh, go over the answers as a group. So uh, if you have any questions about what's going on, about what's coming up, uh, as you run your code, feel free to stick the red post-it note on top of your laptop and uh, let a, uh, we'll be around to help. Um, but otherwise, these are uh, uh, useful exercises for you to be, uh, for you to check out and see what you can do with some of your, your data. Um, yeah, we'll give you a little while to uh, check those out and then we'll circle back, wrap up, and yeah, I'll give you guys a minute to check that out.
Okay. Uh, we're coming up on time. Um, there's just a few minutes left until 1 o'clock, and I know you've all got classes to get to or midterms to study for, this, that, the other thing. Um, so uh, thank you all for coming. Um, before you go, uh, we'd ask that you please take the post-its that you've uh, um, that you had next to your desk. Uh, if you could leave us some feedback on those, that would be great. Uh, if you could write one uh, constructive thing, something maybe that didn't work out super well for you, something that you would have liked to have seen improved, um, on one of the post-it notes and on the other one, please write something that worked out super well for you, something you really enjoyed, something that you liked about the workshops. We take that feedback, we use it to make future workshops better. Um, if you haven't had a chance to sign, hit the sign-in sheet, uh, please do, but judging purely based on numbers, I think most of you got it. Um, and come in next time when we're going to start on the exciting topic of uh, data workflows and automation. Uh, we're going to start learning how to write some code to do all of your work for you, uh, which is awesome. So yeah, uh, hope to see you all back again next week. No, not next week. The week after. Uh, the week after, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we are we are not having a workshop next week because. So in two weeks' time, we will start covering uh, data workflows and automation. Yeah. And thank you again all for coming. Uh, if you could stick your feedback on the door on your way out, that'll let us collect it real easy. Okay.